بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد كلوا واشربوا ولا تسرفوا إنه لا يحب المسرفين وقال الله تعالى ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحرم عليهم الخبائث وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن لجسدك علي حق وإن لعينك عليك حق أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم So dear brothers and sisters The topic today is about health and well-being It's an interesting topic and there's so much to discuss in health and well-being which we can't discuss all today I'm going to mention a few points inshallah that are useful, beneficial and relevant however uh, we have about an hour so I'm going to speak for a short while and then after that I think I will let you ask questions if you have any questions just so that um, I may not be able to cover everything that's relevant to all of you so this way if I can take questions then inshallah anything that's pertinent to you will also be covered inshallah so firstly health and well-being I think there's a cultural element to it certain cultures are healthier than other cultures and when health consciousness becomes a cultural issue it becomes easier everybody's thinking about it because health is to do with the way you work what you eat, what you drink, and the way you move around. If there's a health conscious community and the culture is health conscious, then they will provide health conscious products, health conscious services. And when other people do the similar thing, it becomes easier for you to do the same thing. It is so difficult for people to be on particular diets, especially in the UK and in many, many Asian countries. When you go, they don't understand what a diet is. If you tell them you're on a diet, they'll say, oh, today you're not on a diet. It's okay, one day is okay. They just don't realize every day is that one day. So it's very difficult. Now, if everybody understands health, then number one, they'll probably cook something healthy for you to start with. They're not going to insist that you eat so many unhealthy things and break your diet. So you can understand that when it becomes a culture, it becomes easy. And number two, it needs to be something that your whole family can take up. Otherwise, it's very difficult for one person to be on a diet in a home that everybody else wants to indulge in something else. To cook two meals is very, very difficult. But if you can change it for the whole family, then it becomes easier. So, give you an idea, we started off, we said we eat too much meat. Meat is good for you. You know, meat has protein, the meat is good for you, and there's no doubt, especially healthy meat. Um, but... We just have too much meat. And the Prophet ﷺ did not have that much meat. The Prophet ﷺ saw meat sometimes and when he saw it, mashallah, then he ate. You know, the lamb, the, 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 the goat. Uh, when he saw it, then he enjoyed it. But otherwise, most of the time, he did not have meat on the table. For us, you have to have meat every day. Not just one, but several different types of meat, whether that be uh, fish plus meat plus chicken, whatever the case is. So what we started doing first was that we said, okay, we're going to do one day a week, no meat, no chicken, nothing. Just vegetables, lentils or something. Alhamdulillah, we achieved that. We carried on to such a degree now that it's once or twice a week only that we have meat or chicken. Now, the other thing is that about 100, 200 years ago, there were three, 400 years ago for sure, in the time of... The Prophet ﷺ, there was no chemicals, there were hardly any chemicals. The development in the chemical additives, food additives, and all of these things is much more recent. So, what people were eating was absolutely pure. Even if they were indulging, it was pure. You know, it was maybe a lot of honey they would have. If they wanted something really sweet, it would be a lot of honey. There was no, I don't know when, white sugar, you know, bleached white sugar came into being. Now they're figuring out that it's harmful. And that's why all the drinks and everything, they've had to reduce their sugar content. And you're going to have to get used to it. 
Remember, in all of, a lot of these things, you can actually become accustomed to it. It takes a while, though, to change your mouth palate. Initially, to say that I could never believe that I could have a cup of tea without sugar. How can you have that? That doesn't sound right. That's not tea. You have to have some tea, you have to have some sugar inside, otherwise it's not tea. Well, yeah, it's not your concept of tea. I don't have to take your concept of tea. So it took about three months. Now, alhamdulillah, I can have tea without sugar. Right? It's, it tastes nice now. You actually get the taste of the tea. It's not a sugary drink. Right? So it takes just getting used to. That's what it is. It's just getting used to something. And there's a lot of things like this. I know uh, one kid, he was about uh, 14, 15 years old, and he would waste a lot of water to do wudu because he was doing a proper wudu. So he would go there and he would wash his foot and everything, and so much water was coming down. And I'm telling him a few times, I said, look, you can't, that's too much water. He says, I can't do less than that because he won't wash properly. So then I said, I, can, I think I understand what his, the problem is. So I showed him. I said, this is how you wash. I said, when you put on the tap full, can you see how much water is running down? How many times you're actually washing your foot? Because when it's a full, full blast of water, you, the water, there's so much water. I said, you've washed your foot now 15 times. You know, you've washed your foot 15 times. I think then it clicked. Yes, I, c I can see how much water is now running off. If I do it slow, it still goes. It takes a bit longer, that's all. But I'm not wasting now. So he uses one third of the water now. It's just something we have to change our system. We have to change the way we think about things because all of these are resources from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet told us not to waste water even if you're at the stream. Even if you're at the stream, there's abundant water, it's just flowing, it seems free. Don't even waste water there. So the tap water, you know, whether you have a flat rate water meter or whether you pay for every, you know, now they're putting meters, it doesn't make a difference. We need to preserve for the planet because there's work that goes into making the water pure. And a lot of other people, they suffer because they don't have pure water. It's just a mindset change. Now, some places it's really interesting. I was in America. America is probably the most aware people regarding content of food. So many people, they will understand nutritional, how to read the nutrition list. They will understand carbs and they will understand what a protein is and what fat is and calories are and so on. When I came back to England about over a decade ago, people didn't understand this. The only thing they kind of understood is a bit calories. But in terms of how much protein is in something, they didn't really have. Think people are getting more aware. But yet the most obese people are in America. That's really strange. They are the most aware, but they're very obese. Everybody's big. And you go back to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and people are thin. Right? They get less food. But the strange thing is that in America, it's become like a culture that even the poorer people sometimes, they tend to put on weight because maybe the, what kind of food is available to them. So these additives, they're not helpful. These are things that we need to think about. Subhanallah. Another thing that I want us to think about is what's the benefit of all of this? Why are we even discussing this? The reason we're discussing this is because the Prophet ﷺ said that a strong believer is superior to a weak believer. And a lot of research is showing that what you eat and your environment, even environmental factors is going to affect your health. Health is generally affected by your genetics. If there's a certain gene that is predisposed to diabetes, then you're more likely to get diabetes. This is what the genetics will tell you. But number two, environmental factors. And number three is dietary. The food, that's some, something we can definitely control. Environmental factors, you'd have to move, you'd have to oh, make a lot of difference, make a lot of change. Genetics, subhanAllah, you just have to ask Allah for protection. Right? Like imagine, if all of your family has diabetes, you're most likely going to get it. Right? That's something that we have to... But the health factors, are very, the, the dietary factors, the food we take, our lifestyle choices, very important. Because a stronger believer is better than a weaker believer. 
When you're a stronger believer, you're better. If you're a healthy person, you're less of a burden to somebody else. One of the most important du'as that you will see everybody who goes over the hill starts making. When I say who goes over the hill after they're like 40 years old, or 50 years old, or maybe 60 years old, whenever the hill is for you, whenever you feel like you've just gotten over the hill and now it's just downhill, you know, you, you feel that you need to go to a doctor more often, and you just get tired more quickly, and you don't have the same energy, whenever that is for different people, may Allah delay it for us, but generally after 50, 60, this is how people feel. We become a burden on the system, we become a burden on our family. Can you imagine? One of the du'as of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-haram. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min an uradda ila arda lil umur. Anybody make this du'a? Anybody know about this du'a? Anybody make this du'a? It's a very important du'a. If you read al-hizb al-a'zam, it will come in there. So you'd have made it. Oh Allah, protect me. I seek your refuge from evil old age. I seek your refuge from senility. From becoming senile, from decrepitude, from being returned to evil old age. What is evil old age? This is like when you become helpless. People are suffering from Alzheimer's, people are suffering from Parkinson's, people are suffering from various different debilitating diseases. People are, uh, have a stroke and their paralysis. People cannot, they have, subhanAllah, they have to ask others to help them. They become, we become a burden. That's why many people make this dua, Oh Allah, do not make us dependent on anyone. In Urdu it's famous, Kisi ka muhtaj na banaya, Kisi ka muhtaj na banaya, Kisi ka muhtaj na banaya. Don't make us depend on anybody. What's the point of life? You got at the age of 55, at the age of 65 or something, then for the next 10 years you're alive, but bedridden. Can't do anything. Except just sit there and subhanallah, Allah protect us from such, such a life. May Allah give us a quality life. So now remember, La ilaha illallah, kullun ila ajalim musamma. Everybody's got a fixed date of death. We don't know what it is, but it's fixed. So the date of death could be when you're 60, 70, 80, 90, 95. Could be any time. We don't know. We can't change that. Can't. There's not much you can do to change that. Again, we don't know when it is anyway. It's not like we know when it is and we want to change it. You know, we don't know anyway. But that's. But there's one thing that you do have control over, which is your quality of life. So let's just say you're going to die at the age of 60. Why would you want the last 10 years of life, or starting from now, to be unhealthy? So the quality of life is bad. You may die at the age of 90, but why destroy the quality? You can improve the quality regardless of when we die. We want to improve the quality so that we're functional and productive longer than we're not. And subhanAllah, there's another dua. And these duas are amazing. You see the wisdom in these duas that Prophet used to make. Oh Allah, make the best of my days my final days. SubhanAllah. That doesn't mean that these days have to be bad. These days can be good. But the best, right, are the final days. So that is when I know I'm going to go and I can do the best of my deeds on my final days as well. Otherwise, we're knocked out. Can't do anything. So, the one thing you can do by living a healthier lifestyle is improve the quality of your life. You can't change your date of death, but you can improve the quality of your life. And that's what's important. So, how do you change the quality of life? How do we improve the quality of life? What is health, nutrition, diet? What is all of this? Well, it's, I think, primarily two things right, that we can control. One is exercise and our physical lifestyle. That's one. And number two, it's the food changes we need to make, what we eat. What goes into us is what makes us. There's no doubt about that. So there's both of these things. Now, they're not easy. You tell somebody, well, you need to go and have a jog for 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes every day. It's, I've never done it. How am I going to get that into my life? And jogging can be boring. Some people, they really enjoy it and they thrive on it afterwards. It gives them the endorphins and they get really excited. But for a lot of other people, it's a boring time out 
kind of thing you have to do. Go to the gym, that's another big hassle. Okay, mashallah, some people can play football or some other sport and keep healthy and active in that way, alhamdulillah. Right? You can get rewarded for that if you have the right intentions. So, f- try to find an exercise which you can incorporate in your daily life. That's the easiest. So for example, it could be that instead of taking the car to the masjid, I'll get to the masjid in 3-4 minutes. If I walk, it'll take me 10 minutes walk. They're saying that about 3 times a week, if you can walk for about 30 to 40 minutes, just 3 times a week, it will improve so many things. Diabetes, all of these things. Plus, it will actually improve your cognitive function. Which means our brain power, our intellect, our understanding. Walking helps. 30, 40 minutes of walking, three times a week, helps to keep the brain active and inshallah push back um, these degenerative diseases of the, of the brain and the mind. That's all. Subhanallah. It's not complicated. You see, many of us that I look around here are from countries where it was hard work in the fields. Heat. The heat would burn the fat, make you sweat. Sweating is beneficial for you. Right? So you used to sweat, you used to eat a bit, you used to sweat, you used to work. So keep active. Now here, alhamdulillah, you get free food, you get free income, free welfare, uh, free this, free that, uh, free health care. So it's all cool, it's all fine. Let's just go through the system. What's the point of the system? What's the point of the system? The other thing is now, I'm not giving any fatwa on this, and I don't have any deep research on this, but this is something that those of you who may be in the field can start thinking about. Many of us that I see sitting here are from many thousands of miles away from a different climate and country, with the different kinds of uh, food and produce that they eat down there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created appropriate things for each area spices there's certain spices they just don't grow in the UK certain fruits they just don't grow in the UK the closest place that they'll probably grow in Spain so you've got your fuzzly mangoes that are now they come from Bangladesh but they're actually being planted in Spain right because at least the weather there is a bit better right now I'm just wondering that we live in England, which is a cold climate, cooler climate, and we still eat from another country. I'm not saying it's haram or anything, don't get me wrong. Our diet is what it would have been in Bangladesh or India or Pakistan. But we're in a different country. I'm not trying to say you should start eating fish and chips and boiled sprouts right? and whatever the local cuisine is. What is the local cuisine? It's Bengali food now. It's Indian food now, right? That is the local cuisine now. It's the top food and dish you're saying. We've changed it, mashallah. I don't know how healthy it is. Wallahu alam. I don't know. I'm not saying this. Or, it tastes nice, of course. We enjoy it. But it's something to think about. It's something to do research on. To see that. Because Allah has created everything appropriate to each area. Right? So, wallahu alam. The way the environment, sun reacts to us. What we eat. How it dissolves. How it breaks down in our body what it does and so on and so forth. Do you like fish and chips? Yeah, mashallah. Um, So food. There's a number of things that you can make a difference in. Okay. Now telling you to stop having rice every day is big jihad. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. But rice is a lot of carbohydrates. All right. And... uh, I guess there are ways to cook it. It's probably not going to taste as good, but when you keep, when you, you boil it, you remove the water. You boil it, you remove the water. You have to boil it at least twice. Maybe if you, that you get rid of all of the starch, then it might be okay. And brown rice, wholemeal rice, this doesn't taste right. It has, it's a totally different food. It tastes, if you've tried it, it's totally different. So that's going to be tough. Um, but cut out white bread. Get wholemeal bread. 
See, the idea should be that we're going to get foods that are more refined. The problem today is that better food, healthier food is more expensive, even though it's actually more natural. So white bread, you have to bleach it to make it white. But wholemeal and good wholemeal bread is actually more expensive. That's actually more natural, closer to the original, but it's more expensive. The weird marketing right now, they take sugar out of a product and then they charge you more even though they got less sugar in there. I mean the sugar costs money, they've taken sugar out but they charge you more because it's, because it's got a new fad title for a diet. So these are things to think about. I'm not here to you know, dictate to you what you de eat and what you don't eat, but it's just to make us conscious of what's good for us and what's bad for us. Just try to change. So for example, in our home, we do not have any white pasta. We still have white rice, just can't get used to the other one. I've not tried it properly yet. But in terms of pasta and spaghetti and things like this, it's all wholemeal. Bread is always wholemeal. We, don't, we try to avoid uh, white bread completely. I mean, if you're really adventurous, you can go for sourdough bread. It's made of three ingredients. It's the most healthiest thing out there. There's no yeast in it. It's the oldest recipe in the world. But right now, it's too expensive. A normal loaf of bread costs one pound, and this bread costs three pound a loaf. But once you get hooked onto it, you like it. Problem is that a lot of the research keeps changing. There was a time when butter, butter's always been healthy in a certain, you know, up to a certain limit. And then margarine became healthier. Margarine was a mixture of different oils and fats and then they would solidify it and it was spreadable like butter, so it became easier. Now if you go to the store, you hardly find any margarine. Butter is more healthier and they have spreads, some healthy spreads. They add a bit of olive oil and other oils and then they make a spread. God knows what's healthy, what's not healthy, just stick to the most natural thing. But the most natural things are more expensive. This is the problem. Then, you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that eat and drink, sorry, eat what is lawful. Kulu min tayyibat um, and good. Kulu, uh, so eat what is halal and what is tayyib. That means what is good quality. Um, if, you do a, if you do research on the meat, I, I'm not sure about the fish, but if you do research on the meat quality, that the halal meat industry, it's mostly not the best quality meat that is sold in our halal meat stores. It's not. You know, when you look at fruit, right? If you look at the label, you'll see, say grade A, grade B, and so on. The grade A stuff is better. It's, uh, it's, it's generally classified into these categories. The meat, when you buy meat, you'd see no classification because they'll cut it and send it to you. But generally, it's not A-grade meat that you're eating. Forget organic or whatever. It's just not even A-grade meat. It's not the best cuts that they sell in the halal meat stores. Right? Nobody's even talking about this. Along with that, we need to change our lifestyle in terms of exercise. And as I said, the best exercise is the one you can incorporate in your life. So walking is one of them. Another one is if you're going for work, then rather than going underground or bus or whatever, bike it to work. If it's within 20 minutes of biking, get a bike and do that. If you can bike for 20 minutes a day, not electronic, not, what do you call those? Not the electric bikes, where you have to pedal, right? I'm telling you that is one of the easiest ways to incorporate exercise in your life. It's one of the easiest ways to travel in London, Okay, and it's cheaper because what you have to go to work, you have to go to school, you have to go wherever, get a bike, right? It's much cheaper than everything else, and it it is help it is healthy, and it's in your stride. It's within your daily routine, so that will make it easier. I'm saying a lot of stuff here. Take whatever you can, inshallah, make our life healthy. Okay. The Prophet ﷺ always stayed healthy. And the reason is that he was constantly moving around. You don't generally see any hadith about him doing a particular exercise. You, I, I, I've not come across many hadith where he did a particular exercise. However, there is a hadith in Abu Dawood in which the Prophet ﷺ did wrestling with a man called Rukana. 
wrestling with a man called Rukana. And the Prophet ﷺ took him down. Right? He took him down. So maybe if you can get into some jujitsu, right? Or some other kind of grappling or something like that, that might be very useful. You see, if you look in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of different fruits and vegetables and things like that. So there's a blessing in what's mentioned generally in the Quran and Sunnah. The main thing is that eat whatever you want, but just eat in moderation and eat best quality, the best of the qualities that you can have. That's what's important. So eat less, but eat better quality rather than abundant, buy one, get one free things with full of chemicals and so on. And then you're just munching those things away. One of the things I don't know, one of the things that a lot of people are challenged by is that they have their meals. But for in between, the grazing is what they call the worst thing you can do. Grazing means, yes, nibbles, grazing, you know, it's like the cows, they eat all day, right? They just keep, you know, they just keep eating all day. And that's how we've become. So have some good meals, healthy meals, balanced meals. Then you don't have to graze all day, like keep going into the kitchen, taking a snack, a packet of crisps, some chocolate, some nuts, some fruit. Or if you do have to graze, then have fruit. Always have fruit there. Some people cannot eat fruit. It's like, what is that, man? They can't eat fruit. Okay, if you don't like your regular... I mean, subhanAllah, you know, what it is, is that if you have no idea about fruit, you're not going to enjoy it. Because always you're getting a royal gala apple or a whatever, right? Those are... You need to be discriminate in the food. There are... MashaAllah, in England, we have many different types of apples. And some of them are really amazing. You'll, you'll not get them anywhere else. So, what I'm trying to say is that if you kind of explore apples, you can find one that you like. If you explore oranges, so you know, you get tangerines, you get satsumas, you get nectarines, you get uh, clementines. Some, uh, personally, I prefer clementines, I don't prefer satsumas, right? Some people can't even tell the difference. It's all the same for them. It's a good idea to try to figure out what you like and get that kind of particular fruit, not just jackfruit all the time, right? Um, so that way you can actually have a healthier diet. Another thing they say, and I read this many years ago in a book by Imam Khalil al-Nahlawi called Kitab al-Hadr wal-Ibaha. He said that have your fruit before the meal. I was like, that's strange. We generally have fruit after the meal. Why is he saying that? Recently, somebody who's doing dietary region, they told us, they read it, that the reason why you should, you should actually have fruits beforehand rather than after is because once you've eaten, food is heavier, it takes longer to digest. Fruit is lighter, it's faster to digest. That's going to be on top of the food, it ferments, right? And then it can give you gases and things. If you have fruit in the beginning, it will actually uh, uh, dissolve faster. And then the, your food on top of that. It's a bit weird, but you know, we have to sometimes just change our systems. Should you have sweet before or sweet after? This is a debate. So you say, what is sunnah? Is it after? What is the sunnah when the Prophet ﷺ just dealt with dates and water for so many days on end? Right. Did he drink the water first or the dates first? Allahu a'lam. The hadith mentions that for so many days the cooker, they would not put the fire on. So you're talking about um, places with two or three dishes. Okay. And I don't want to ask this question, but how many of you regularly just have one dish for a meal? Probably nobody. How many of you just have one dish? MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Allah bless you guys. Because your tradition is to have three, four, right? You have to have three, four. MashaAllah, the women, their efforts. You're going to say, I'm messing up the women. You should just one dish. Eat properly, one dish. You just have one dish. Okay. MashaAllah. It's just we need to, because we need a better quality of life so we can, you see the hadith of the Prophet said that there are two things which 
everybody is so deluded about. Everybody is in deception. As-sihah wal farag. You heard the hadith, but in a different context. One is well-being, siha, and the other one is uh, free time. So right now, if I've got well-being, I don't think I'm going to get sick. So I delay my worship. I want to be healthy in my older age. Because I feel that because I'm going to be older, I'm going to have more ability to worship, more interest to do worship. If I can't come to the masjid at that time, because somebody has to bring me, that's going to be difficult. I go for hajj. And generally I go with a group and uh, many of the people that come for hajj are middle age to older age. Because finally, you know, they're old enough to do hajj. And in some cultures, they actually say you should do hajj when you retire. Once we had a, in, in hajj, I had a, this 32 year old or something, 30, 32 year old. Uh, he said, Sheikh, I've got a question for you. I thought it must be about hajj. It was about hajj. He said, is it okay for me to be in hajj? I said, okay, subhanAllah, I said, maybe he's got some debts, or maybe he's done some haram or something, maybe. I said, what do you mean? He said, my family is telling me you're too young for hajj. He's 32 years old, not Huzaifa's age, right? He's 32 and his family is telling you you're not old enough for hajj, right? So, I said, what do you mean? So what I figured out, they, they think in some communities, some call, they think that you only do hajj after you retire. So then you don't do any sin afterwards. All right? It's crazy. I've seen people and they come for hajj and they're struggling. They can't go and pelt the shaitan. They have to send up. You go, you go to the place where you pelt shaitan. This person doing seven. And then it carries on. I say, well, you only do seven, brother. He said, I'm doing it for somebody else. Because nobody, they can't go. What's the point of that kind of hajj? Go hajj when you're young. Do the hajj and you imagine. You know, why would you have to be pushed in a wheelchair? Okay, go when you're old again, alhamdulillah, that's fine. But don't wait. There's quality of life is very important. That's why uh, the ulama here, you should actually, I think masajid should do this because I think our people don't understand health issues. For example, related to heart, our cardiovascular problems, right? So I, once in one masjid, alhamdulillah, we kept a program, we got a heart uh, doctor to come in and show pictures and everything of how tough it is when you have a heart disease. And alhamdulillah, I think it woke a lot of people up. Because when we don't know, we think, Jolo, it's fine, you know, because we're blind to it. I think if you have this kind of a program about diet and so on, because why? Because subhanAllah, these people who come to our masjid, we want them to continue coming and benefiting from the masjid. We don't want a community, a committee, a community, people in our community that are a burden on the society, on the NHS. We thank Allah for the NHS. I've lived in countries where there is no NHS. In America, even if you have insurance where you're paying for a family, you'll be paying about $600 a month on insurance. But to visit the doctor, you still have to pay a copay of $40, $50 every time you go to visit the doctor. Do you guys understand the value of your NHS? You should make dua that Allah maintains it and preserves it. I'm telling you, in America, I, uh, you know, I've got a number of students, I've lived there as well, you have to have insurance. Unless you're very poor, then you might get covered or something, right? The insurance cost five to $700 minimum insurance for a family, and you still have to pay every time you go to see a doctor. It's called a copay. And if you then have hospital treatment, there's a certain amount, you have to first cover yourself first, $1,500, then if it's anything bigger than that, the insurance will pay. What a con. They've purposely inflated the prices of everything. So if you don't want to have insurance and you actually want to go to hospital and pay yourself, you'll pay triple the amount of what an insurance company will pay. It's prohibitive. It is really messed up. Here we have, alhamdulillah, the NHS that even if you're wealthy, you still get covered. Yes, you have to wait and you keep, cu- you keep complaining. It is still better. Alhamdulillah, the quality is still good. Yes, there are issues always. You know, there's going to be some issue or the other. We make dua that Allah and we thank Allah we have this. A few other points. Another thing is about medicines. So, you know, we're used to our paracetamols and um, glycolazide and metformin and all of these other uh, medicines. 
And there's a lot of people, they, they, you know, there's side effects to these things. So a lot of people say, we don't want to take these and there's side effects. Now, I'm not here as a proponent for Western medicine or allopathic medicine. I love alternative medicines. Like I use a lot of alternative medicines, naturopathic medicines, homopathic medicines, Ayurvedic medicines, Yunani medicines. I've tried all of them. Now, you see, Yunani medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, which you find in the Indian subcontinent. Generally, the Ayurvedic medicine is through the Hindu line. Uh, the Hindus generally use that a lot. The Yunani, which is actually Hellenistic Greek medicine, but has been, I don't know if they even do it in Greece anymore, but it's been pres preserved in the subcontinent among our Muslim tradition. The Yunani medicine, which works with the humors of the body to try to balance them, to try to actually bring a cure and not just to uh, cover the disease or to tranquilize you or to give you some uh, short-term comfort or whatever the case is. However, the problem is that all of those medicines were functioning at a time when foods were much more natural. That's when they were developed based on the foods that were available. Everything was natural. Now we have a diet full of chemicals. Just look at anything, even a simple thing. You'll have several kind of chemicals and sometimes E numbers. Right? And you just know what they are. So that's probably why these medicines, if you take them, they may take longer to function because they may not be able to counteract the chemical. Wallahu alam, I don't know. That's why your paracetamol works faster because it's been tested uh, in line with what people have in their body. But that doesn't mean that you don't use them. I found huge benefit in homopathic medicine, huge benefit, and naturopathic medicine. For example, uh, I have not taken anti biotics for about 15 years never I've you know when you go for hide you get that cough and they just give you antibiotics right I've not used garlic garlic is a natural antibiotic alhamdulillah it's worked alhamdulillah alhamdulillah and there's different countries they do weird things they're telling me in India for COVID they were giving antibiotics I mean it's not a bacteria it's a virus it's not a bac it's not bacterial problem and I've noticed that where the countries where you have to pay for your medicine, the doctors will write you 10 medicines. And here in England, you go to the doctor, he will not write you any medicine. I tell you, I have chicken soup, right? And he might give you medicine, you know, when, you know, like if you really push it, then they'll give you medicine. Why? Because it costs them. Whereas they, it costs you, so they, they make money from this. It's, there's a lot of gerber in this. I don't want to get into anti-vax and pro-vax and conspiracy. That's not my job here today. But... Health and diet is a big idea. And what we need to do is the benefit of exercise. Increase your muscle tone. Improve flexibility. Enhanced endurance. You'll be able to go on for longer without getting tired. Increases your bone density. Otherwise, your bones start getting weaker. You don't realize it. You think, uh, I don't have to do any work. I'm the sert. I'm the, you know, I'm the boss. I can just... Tell people what to do and I can just sit here taking the money in. It's not beneficial for you. That's not that useful. Have you noticed in some of our countries, the richer people, they're the fat ones? Who just sit. They're, they're, they have all of these different foods. And they're, they're the fatter ones and everybody else is nice and thin, mashallah, and you know, fit. I mean, that's not very useful, is it? In fact, in some of our cultures, being fat was like, uh, you know, mashallah, praiseworthy idea. It's a praiseworthy idea, that means you're eating something. The other thing it does is that it strengthens the heart. And exercise helps to, f uh, it fights stress and depression. I mean, we really have to think about a certain things. Let me just finish and I'll tell you. It balances blood pressure, reduces the risk of developing other diseases. Uh, weight training, for example, it increases muscle strength, reduces fat, fights back pain. People sit all in like, I've got back pain. You're not exercising the back muscles, so you're going to have back pain. Right? And overall mental health is increased. Now you see, for men, they generally tend, they get to go out. But what happens to our women? A lot of women say, you know what, I do more work than you because i constantly walking around, running after the children, going to cook, going from one room to the next. That's 
it's okay, it's not good enough. Because your heart rate doesn't go up in there. But where do they go to do exercise while maintaining the hijab and haya and things like that? And this is something I think we're neglecting. See, in some Muslim countries, like in Morocco and so on, they have the Riyadh uh, kind of uh, set up in the homes where they have this open air area in the, in the middle which they get exposure to the sun and everything. Many of, uh, many of the women, they have vitamin D deficiencies. Right? Iron deficiencies, a number of deficiencies like this. So we really need to think as a community for, for example, halal women, gyms, women exercise, women swimming, etc. Because otherwise, how do they stay healthy? Really something we need to think of. We've been here 60 years. The Muslim community in general, overall speaking, is about 60 in terms of the mass migrations. 60 years. And we've seen two generations pass. Right? So we really need to think about these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made make it easy for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, your body has haq over you. You have to look after your body. Right? You have to look after your body. Thereafter that, the Prophet sallallahu said, it's a hadith of Tirmidhi, that the worst vessel, the worst container that you can fill up is your stomach. مَا مَلَأَ إِبْنُ آدَمْ وِعَاءً شَرًّا مِّن بطنه. It's the worst container you can fill up. This, when a dietitian listens to this, a non-Muslim dietitian is like, wow, what a statement. So much wisdom, so comprehensive. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, بِحَسْبِ إِبْنِ آدَمْ أُكَيْلَاتُ أُكُلَاتْ يُقِمْنَ صُلْبَ It's enough for a human to just eat enough to keep your back straight. Like just eat enough to have enough energy to get by. That's enough. Which is really a small amount. فَإِنْ كَانَ لَا مَحَالَ But if you need to eat more, because of whatever reason, that's fine. فَثُلُثٌ لِطُعَامِهِ وَثُلُثٌ لِشَرَابِهِ وَثُلُثٌ لِنَفْسِهِ Then, okay, fine. You can fill one third for food, one third for water, liquids, and one third for air. I know that's difficult because we're used to filling the whole stomach with food. The water just finds its way around and the air will just, eventually it'll get there. It's okay, right? I know it's difficult. I find it tough. But I can't, just because I can't do this, I can't not mention this hadith to you. I don't want to sound hypocritical. I wish I could do this. But at least we should know so it's a target that we have. Right? It's a target that we have. Right? So... Ramadan is coming, less mishti, less jilafi. Uh, we, we have to try to get healthier. We have to try to get healthier. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one day allow us to do this. The Prophet said, eat, uh, sorry, Allah says, Surah Al-A'raf, eat, drink, kulu, washrabu, wala tusifu, but don't waste. And if you eat more than normal, that's wasting. Because that's, op- that's over the top. It's also dhulm. Dhulm means placing something in the wrong place. So once the stomach is full, put any more food in there, it's a dhulm, it's oppression. You know, when I go to somebody's house, you know when you go to visit three, four, five days, everybody wants to feed you, and I'm like, man, I've had enough. But our culture doesn't allow, it's like you let somebody go from your house without eating, that's haram, you know, you can't do that. You ask them for water, they will never bring you water, they bring you coke. Like I ask for water, you know, uh, as though water is unhealthy, you know. So then I have to tell them that it's, going to be oppression, I'm going to be sinful if I eat, they're like, oh, okay, right. then it's okay, understand? So, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this easy, Allah wants us to eat and drink and benefit, but just to carry on, it's not something, we need to keep ourselves healthy so that we do not become a burden, and may Allah do not allow us to become a burden on anyone, may Allah not allow us to reach an evil old age, may Allah allow us to remain healthy forever, right, until we die, and may Allah take us in a good way, so that our best days are our final days. May Allah accept our dua and give us understanding. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Okay, if you have any questions. Prophetic medicine is, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there were certain, the learning about medicine came from Jundi Shapur. I think in Persia, there was like a university or some kind of a learning environment there. 
Otherwise, there was just basic kind of understanding. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned certain things to have shifa. So for example, there are seven famous things, well-known things rather, that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to be of benefit. One of them <clears throat> is honey, which is uh, the Prophet Allah mentions it, fihi shifa nas. I think that's the big thing. Shifa, honey has shifa. That doesn't mean you overindulge. If you overindulge in anything, so if so, if you're gonna if you've got diabetes, I saw one guy with diabetes and he took the honey, two, three, four tablespoons. Like that's not good, you know. Just because it's got shifa, it doesn't mean you overdo it. It's shifa in a certain amount. So honey is one shifa product. Number two, you can help me out if you know. Number two is senna. In Arabic, senna. That is considered to have shifa. Apparently a lot of people found benefit in there in COVID. I used it when I had COVID as well. Number three is the black seed. You can have that as oil. You can have the seeds. The Prophet talked about the habba to sauda. Every one of these has a certain benefit the Prophet mentioned. This is all prophetic medicine, right? Number four. Olive. Olive oil. Right? In general, that's mentioned in the Quran as well. Then you have... Ajwa seeds, so ajwa dates and ajwa seeds, they both have a certain benefit. Thereafter that there's something called al-qust, al-qust al-hindi, or al-qust al-bahri, the costus root. That's certain supposed to have benefit. And there's several other things. So, for example, in some of these prophetic medicine places, there's also safarjal. I think that's called the quince. That there was a paste I bought of that. That's mentioned in the hadith as well, the quince. Thereafter that, there's several other things. I, I can't remember everything off the top of my head. I remember once I even bought this seven shifa paste. It was made up of seven of these shifa products with zamzam. So you had the ajwa dates, honey, kust al-hindi, uh, it had the sana, it had uh, the date pits of the ajwa, and it had a few other things. And mashallah, they, they were telling me that this has caused, cure, mashallah, cured a lot of people. So, essentially, prophetic medicine is what the Prophet mentioned certain shifa in there of certain products that were available there. <clears throat> yes? How much of his sweets are we allowed to eat? Okay. Omar, how many sweets is he allowed to eat? Not that many. Not that many. Maybe, I don't know, a few sweets, uh, a few small sweets a day. Or uh, maybe a bar of chocolate uh, once or twice a week. Is that alright? Yeah, just a bit. Just, just a few. Are you talking about jelly sweets? So, look, <clears throat> what I, uh, the, the, I'm just going to repeat the question. The brother said that there are certain diseases which we, there's no supposed cure for, like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. There's also um, eczema issues. I would say that don't just stick to your doctor, right? I'm not against Western medicine, we use it, but I want to be comprehensive. Western medicine has had an amazing breakthrough in terms of surgery, in terms of <clears throat> immunization, and a few other things. But they're still weaker in some aspects, because medicine is a multi-pronged approach dealing with many different assets. And Western medicine is not at the top in everything. It is in many, many things. I, my approach is always to be a comprehensive approach of other alternative options. For example, eczema, what we found to be useful is that if you stop using fabric conditioner, right? If you stop using fabric conditioner and instead you use essential oils. So when you're doing your washing, use your washing powder if you want. <clears throat> and then you add, instead of fabric conditioner, you add a bit, a few drops of essential oil. You can buy them online. You know, whether that be lavender, lavender um, there's a citronella, there's a number of others that you can, frankincense, whatever. Mashallah, it will give your uh, clothes a nice smell, but it will be natural. And alhamdulillah, that's helped the children to avoid the eczema. Blood type. There are diets out there called a blood type diet. Depending on your blood type, there's certain foods you can't eat. Go much deeper. I found them, some people, it's worked amazing for them. Like they had certain issues, it's just stopped. 
One guy that I know, he, I knew he had a massive headache problem, migraines all the time. About 10 years ago, maybe more. He stopped sugar. He said, I don't have these issues anymore. So we may be, it may be a reaction to certain foods that you have that is causing this. So it's a long process, but don't just stick to your doctor. Get that, but then try other means as well. There's a lot of stuff online and it won't harm you to, to try it. And, so that's two. Number three, try all the Shifa products you can get. Incorporate honey into your diet. Incorporate black seed. There's a friend, a friend of mine, I haven't met him in a while because he's in America now, but he told me the last time, I think this was uh, several months ago, he says that since he found out about black seed, which was about 10 years ago, he said he started having black seed, black seed, black seed with every meal. The way he used to have it is, you know, you get those pepper, uh, electronic battery operated pepper grinders. You put the pepper corn inside and then you press the button and then it grinds it for you. He said he put black seed in there. We did the same. Whether it was his breakfast, you know, not, not cereal, but you know, when you're having your eggs or something and lunch. He said three meals a day I was adding black seed. He said three things changed in him. I forget exactly what it was. He had a certain issue. And he said, then he, after some months when he went to the doctor, he says that the doctor was amazed and shocked that he says that your level of that is like a teenager's level now, right? So these things do help, but you need a sustained approach because it is competing with a lot of the chemicals we're putting in our body because we're not eating healthy anyway. You understand? So it has to be a multi-pronged approach. And then you ask Allah for shifa. Yeah. Look, uh, there's a lot of honeys out there. And manuka honey is very good. I've been to, I've seen the manuka plant. I've been to a place called Manukau. I, it's New Zealand, right? It's a, it has a certain quality which is, but to be honest, it tastes nice. But it's not really, they say that the benefit of it is not, it's more topical benefit. It's an anti-microbial. If you have a wound or a rash or something, it's really good. I use, I, ha I have some very uh, high uh, intensity because they come in different intensities. I have a very high one. It's like a small thing like that was 50 pounds or something like that. You know when I use it? You know when you have a sore throat? You take a bit on a spoon and you put it in your mouth and you leave it there. For as long, you don't try to ingest it. You just leave it there. Alhamdulillah, it helps to get rid of that because it's got those antimicrobial properties. Do you understand? Any pure honey, they say the, local, the more local the honey, the better because it's going to take from your local plants that are causing your allergies or whatever the case is. I would avoid just going and buying the regular honey in the store because that's just produced mass market. If you can get a farmer's market honey online, you get good honeys. That would be good. Sidr honey is good as well, right? Uh, bet the, 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 the honey, the best honey I've had in the world, to be honest, uh, aside from the sidr, is the Western Australian Jarrah honey. It has the same kind of thing as Manuka, it's just not as well marked, so I don't know, but it is amazing. But that doesn't mean you have to go and look out for that and get that, it's not necessary. Do you understand? It's just get any good honey, and inshallah, Allah gives shifa. And then read Ya Shafi on it. Yes, Hudayfa, I'll come to you next. Where is the black seed? What is this black seed? I wish I brought some with me. There is little, uh, there is little seeds. It's black, right? They're, they come from a plant of some sort. So you can taste it. It's got a bit of a hot taste. Or you can make an oil from it. You can have a little sip of that. Or you can just add it to your food. Sometimes you might even see in food, they sprinkle it on top of breads or something sometimes. So it's black seed. If you can't find any, then um, his dad will get it for him. You better get him some black seed now. You have it at home, or you better show him to him today. Right? Inshallah. Any other questions? No more questions? Huzaifa, no more questions? Okay. Jazakallah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us healthy. May Allah give us an understanding of what's good for us and allow us to follow it and what's bad for us and to avoid it and make us a healthy community so that we can be productive individuals and meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best of ways. Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. 
the next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind, you can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.